A data type is the most basic idea in programming. It tells the computer what kind of data we are storing and what low-level operations are allowed on that data. There are two types of data, namely primitive data types and user-defined data types. Primitive data types include integer numbers, real numbers, which are also called floating-point numbers in computer language, then characters, strings, and Boolean values. When we choose a data type, we are basically giving the computer a strict rulebook about how that particular piece of data behaves. Suppose we store an integer. The computer knows it should keep only integer values, like 5 or 10 or minus 3, and allow operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. If we store a real number or a floating point number, the computer knows it must support decimal values and handle operations that work with fractions. If we store a character such as the letter A, the computer will treat it as a single symbol and allow operations like comparing whether one character comes before another in alphabetical order. If we store a string like hello, the computer sees it as a sequence of characters arranged together and allows actions like joining hello with world to form a longer string. If we store a Boolean value, the computer treats it as either true or false with no other possible states. It allows simple logical operations, such as checking whether a condition is true or combining two Boolean values using logical rules. These data types have fixed memory layouts and fixed sets of basic operations defined by the language itself. I think you might know that computers work using only zeros and ones, and it knows nothing else, because all electronic circuits understand just two states, on or off. So every data type, no matter how it looks, must eventually be broken down into a pattern of zero and one bits. Zero means one bit, and a one means one bit shown using this box. Now, an integer, for example, is usually stored in a fixed layout such as 32 bits. This means the computer reserves a block of 32 positions, each holding either 0 or 1, and together those bits represent the whole number. Because the size is fixed, the computer knows exactly how to read, write, and perform operations like addition or comparison efficiently. For example, 24 looks like this in bits, and 18 looks like this. Then a Boolean value is even simpler, since it only needs to represent two possibilities, true or false. The computer can store it using just a single bit. One bit is enough because it can hold either zero or one, and we can map zero to false and one to true. This is why Boolean operations are extremely fast. The computer checks or flips just one bit. A character is typically stored using 8 bits, forming what we call a byte. Each character, like A, B, or Z, has a predefined binary pattern within these 8 bits. For example, the letter A has a specific pattern of zeros and ones that the system recognizes. Because every character uses the same 8-bit size, the computer can easily handle strings and text by processing one fixed size unit at a time. So when we declare a variable like x as an integer number, the computer already knows that x plus 2 is valid, but x joined with world is not valid for this data type. It is important to note that the data type is not about the real world meaning of the data. For example, the integer number 10 might represent age, marks, or distance, but the data type only cares that it is an integer and only integer operations can apply to it. After primitive data types, most programming languages also allow user-defined data types. A user-defined data type is a type created by the user or the programmer itself by grouping existing data types together into a single meaningful unit. It allows us to represent more complex data models that are not provided directly by the programming language. Common user-defined data types include structures, classes, enumerations, and unions. 
A structure lets us combine multiple pieces of information, even if they are of different data types, into one single unit. For example, imagine we create a structure called student. Inside it, we keep an integer number field called roll number, a string field for the name of the student, and a real number field for percentage. All these fields stay grouped together, and we handle them as one combined type called student structure. A class is very similar, but it goes one step further by allowing functions inside it that can act directly on the stored data. For example, if we make a class called bank account, we may keep fields like an integer for account number and a real number for balance. And we may also include functions like deposit and withdrawal, whose job will be to update the balance field. In this way, a class not only stores data, but also controls how that data is used. These user-defined data types allow us to design more meaningful and custom models, such as a student, a bank account, while still depending on simple building blocks like integers, characters, strings, and Boolean values. Noise! Once primitive and user-defined data types are understood, we will now move to abstract data types. An abstract data type, or ADT, tells us what we can do with the data and how the data should logically behave, but it does not reveal how the computer actually stores the data. This separation makes ADTS extremely powerful because it lets us think at a higher level without getting lost in low-level technical details. For example, a stack is an abstract data type where items are added and removed from only one end, called the top. It follows the rule last in, first out, meaning the last item you place is the first one you take out. A stack says we can push an item on top, then pop the top item, and peek or look at the top item. The behavior is fixed. The last item we add must be the first item we remove. But the ADT does not tell us whether the programmer uses an array or a linked list or something else internally to store data in a stack. The same idea applies to a queue, which is also an abstract data type where items are added at the back and removed from the front. It follows the rule first in, first out, meaning the first item you place is the first one you take out. So a queue ADT allows adding at the back and removing from the front. Whether the queue is made using a circular array or a set of connected nodes does not matter. All that matters is that the behavior remains the same, first in, first out. The same idea applies to a list or an array, ADT, where we can insert an item, delete an item, or get an item at a certain position. We do not care whether the list stores items in continuous memory or scattered nodes connected through pointers. Another useful example is a map ADT. A map ADT stores data in key value pairs, where each key is unique and helps you quickly find its matching value. For example, you can store a student's roll number as the key and the student's name as the value. Like first roll number corresponds to John, eighth roll number corresponds to Tom, and maybe roll number 23 corresponds to Eva. We know we can insert a new key value pair, search the value using the key, or remove a pair, but we do not have to worry whether the map is implemented using a tree-like structure or a hashing technique. To tie this with a real-world example, imagine a car ADT. When you think of a car, you already know its allowed actions – start, stop, accelerate, brake, turn left, and turn right. These actions define how the car behaves from the outside. But you do not need to know whether the engine is petrol, diesel, or electric to use these actions or what type of gear mechanism the car uses or what type of materials are used to build this car. You also do not care whether the wiring is arranged in one way or another. The internal mechanism is hidden and only the behavior is exposed. That is exactly how an ADT works. It exposes the operations and hides the internal design. Two cars can behave the same 
even if the technology inside them is completely different. Just like two stacks can behave the same, even if one uses an array and the other uses a linked structure. Now before we end this video, we will be looking at different types of data structures. Data structures can broadly be separated into two major categories, linear and nonlinear. A data structure is considered linear when its elements are arranged one after another in a straight, sequential manner. In such structures, every element, except the first and last, has exactly one element before it and one after it. Arrays, linked lists, stacks, and queues all follow this linear arrangement. A structure becomes nonlinear when this straight ordering does not exist. The elements here do not follow a single chain. Instead, a single element may connect to many others. A tree is a perfect example of such nonlinear data structures where one node may point to two or more children, so it does not satisfy the one predecessor, one successor idea. A graph is another common nonlinear structure because nodes can have multiple connections going in many possible directions. These structures spread out instead of forming a single sequence. Beyond linear and nonlinear, data structures can also be grouped into static and dynamic types. Static data structures allocate memory during compile time, meaning their maximum size is fixed from the beginning. The benefit is fast access, since the memory layout never changes, but operations like inserting or deleting elements are slower because the structure cannot easily grow or shrink. Arrays fit into this category because their size must be decided beforehand in most of the programming languages. Dynamic structures allocate memory during runtime, so their size can change based on the program's needs. This flexibility makes insertion and deletion quick and efficient, but accessing elements becomes comparatively slower because the data may not be stored in continuous memory. Linked lists are the most common example of dynamic data structures. Since both static and dynamic structures have opposite sets of strengths and weaknesses, no single type is universally better. The right choice always depends on what the problem requires, like speed, flexibility, memory efficiency, or how easily it can be modified. In the next video, we will discuss the asymptotic analysis, which is the primary mathematical method used to evaluate an algorithm's time and space complexity. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, you can support my channel by joining our community and becoming a member. So good.